Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, oh, you don't have to applaud for me. Save applause for this guy. He's got the, the real stuff to say. Um, so this is our March uh, public lecture. It is March, right? Yeah, March public lecture. Our first March public lecture. Our next one is actually March 31st. And then we won't have one for April because, well, we did one at the end of March. So um, if you haven't been to one of these events before, we have regular public lectures and stargazing here once a month in the department. Uh, up at the front, you may have seen the schedule, which you can pick up, which has our listing through June, but then we'll put one together for the second half of the year in May or June. Uh, we also have astronomy on tap events. For those of you of age, you can attend events in a local bar uh, in Old Town, Pasadena, which have less formal talks. They're two 15, 20-minute talks on some sort of astronomical science that are given uh, in a bar. So you can be drinking and interacting with scientists at the same time and listening to scientific talks. So we encourage you to, uh, to show up to that if you're of age 21. Sorry, guys. Uh, and, and they're lots of fun. Our next one is a week from this Monday, and you can go to our website that's also listed on the flyer uh, to find out information about those events. Again, those, those events are also once a month. Uh, tonight, in addition to Constantine's talk, we will be having observing on the fields just behind the building. Uh, so. Again, if you haven't been to one of these events before, basically what we have is after I finish talking in the next couple of minutes, we'll have a 30-minute, roughly 30-minute lecture. And then after the lecture, you're, you're, uh, you're free to remain in here. We'll have a, a question and answer panel where you can ask any kind of relevant scientific questions, mostly astronomy and astrophysics, but any questions of our expert panel consisting of graduate students and postdoctoral researchers on a variety of topics, whether they be uh, exoplanetary or, or, or anything. Um, alternatively, you can go out onto the, to the field and look through the telescopes that we have set up. And it's really good observing conditions tonight, so we should be able to see a lot of really cool stuff. Or you can jump, and f jump uh, back and forth between the two, because both events will be going on until 9 o'clock. So we encourage you to, to check everything out. Uh, there's one rule, though, they just redid the surface on the field. It's all artificial turf now. And so they're being really uh, careful about not having food, beverage, cigarettes, pets, litter, and high heels on the, uh, on the field because the high heels can poke a hole in the artificial turf and cost the athletics department a lot more money than I want to give them. So please, if you have high heels, it's very comfortable. Take, take your shoes off. And, and walk on the field barefoot. It should be nice. Uh, and as a last announcement, we're recording these lectures. So if you miss something or you want to show your friends, it's all available on our website after, after the fact. And you can go to, uh, to our website and, and click on the recorded lectures. And it has all of our recorded lectures since last year. So check it out. Uh, our speaker for tonight is Dr. Constantine Batigan. He's a professor in the Planetary Sciences Department here at Caltech. Uh, you may have read about some of his work with the Planet Nine that was announced last year. Uh, that was, that was uh, he and, and Mike Brown did some work basically indicating that there might be a planet in, uh, in the solar system beyond what we've detected already. Uh, but that's not what he's going to talk about tonight. Uh, he, He's from Moscow, but uh, did his undergraduate work at UC Santa Cruz and has been at Caltech for his PhD and is now a faculty here. And interestingly enough, he's also in a rock band. He's the lead singer in a rock band. And they're having a performance. <laughs> There's information about that performance up here on St. Patrick's Day of this year in Old Town, Pasadena at the Old Town Pub. You can go see him perform. So if you like what you hear tonight, uh, <laughs> Maybe you'll like what you hear in a few weeks. So please welcome Dr. Batigan. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, it'll, be, uh, it'll definitely be fun. There will, uh, I don't know if there'll be an impromptu Planet Nine 
lecture at the pub. Uh, we'll see. We'll see uh, how much you know, how much beer there is. Um, all right. So thank you all for coming. Today I want to talk a little bit about a subject which is quite close to, uh, you know, one of my favorite things ever, exoplanets, and um, sort of debating on what picture to put on the opening slide. Usually pe people put pictures of planets on the opening slide. I've decided to uh, put up a picture of broken gears because uh, I think it's much more representative of scientific theories and how they, you know, evolve in time. So sort of if you look from afar, it looks sophisticated and, you know, like the gears are turning. But really, you know, most of the time it's kind of in this state. And that will be a repeating theme, I think, uh, throughout the next 30 minutes. So the search for planets around other stars is really nothing new at all. Um, a certain gangsta from the 1500s named uh, Giordano Bruno said, the space which, the space we declare to be infinite, in it are an infinity of worlds of the same kind as our own. Um, he was also burned at the stake for saying this. Um, so he quite revolutionary um, at the time. So, but it is really an intriguing, intriguing philosophical advancement because what this implies, right, this implies a belief in the fact that the universe is governed by certain laws and these laws are not special at home, they're universal. So, you know, it kind of makes sense to ask why did Bruno think this way? And I think the kind of modern interpretation of, of the answer to the question of why is because he believed that planet formation is a generic physical process. Right? There's nothing special about the sun, per se. In fact, he was one of the first proponents of the Copernican view of the world and one of the first to propose that distant stars are not just flashlights glued to the night sky. They're, they really are kind of islands of their own which host their own planetary system. Okay? So the understanding of how planets form, how solar systems evolve, is crucial to motivating the search for planets around other stars. Of course, we know at this point, sort of from history, that even though attempts to detect planets around other stars dated back actually to that time, Huygens in the, I think, 1600s carried out the first search, the first astronomical search for extrasolar planets, didn't find anything. Uh, of course, and first exoplanets were found in our lifetime. Uh, but progress was made nevertheless, and that progress was mostly aimed at understanding how did our own solar system form, right? How did it come to be to better, you know, better motivate, better equip the search for exoplanets? So this is our own solar system, highly not to scale. Um, actually, the planets are pretty well represented, right? Their orbital distances are not to scale. Um, there are eight planets in the solar if, if you love Pluto, I'm sorry. Um, if you just look at the solar system, there's a clear dichotomy, right? You can draw a line right here and immediately see that there's big stuff over there and small stuff over here. Okay. That's one of the prevalent features of the solar system, is that it's divide, seemingly divided in two. Here's a brief overview of how planetary systems form. So we start out in these giant molecular clouds that are turbulent. They hang in this delicate balance between the binding uh, forces of gravity and the repelling forces of thermal pressure, effectively. And occasionally, as they cool, parts become sufficiently cold that they collapse and form stars. And these big associations of gas can produce up to, I don't know, realistically up to 10,000 stars, uh, sometimes even more. Some are as small as 10. Okay? They span a really large range. This is, by the way, not an observation. This is a computer simulation. Uh, but it is one that produces something that looks 
a lot like the, for example, Orion you know, uh, star forming region. Um, each one of those dots are, of course, stars. And when stars collapse, they have to conserve angular momentum, right? Just like a ballerina, which during the jump will bring her arms close to her, her body and spin really fast. The same exact process happens when uh, these big cloud clumps of gas, which are initially more or less spherical, collapse. They spin up. They spin up to the point where they can't sustain their own rotation. So even though most of the mass collapses to the center to form a newly, to form a young star, most of the angular momentum, the sense of motion, gets redistributed into a disk of mostly hydrogen helium gas, uh, which holds all of the sense of rotation, so to speak. So the, these disks that are now directly imaged, we see them all over the place, um, are there because things spin ever so slightly. Right? And so there's this weird dichotomy of, of the 1%. Right? Even though the host star holds 99% of the mass, the angular momentum is held in the one, remaining 1% 1 of uh, the matter that encircles the young star. So it's just like the income distribution, right? Like most, right the 1% the you know, holds all the angular momentum. Uh, and, and the rest of us are kind of sitting in the center. Um, these disks are where planets form. How do they actually form? Well, this is not really a solved question, but we've made a ton of progress in the last uh, decade or so. If you zoom in onto a box inside uh, the nebula, okay, what you'll find is that, it's of course, gas, but 1% of the mass inside this nebula is made up of solid material, mostly pebbles, right? things that are I don't know, centimeter across. And as these centimeter pebbles stream, ooh, I have no idea that transition exists. Anyway, <laughs> as, the, uh, 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 as these pebbles stream in that local box, what happens to them is uh, they tend to clump together. Why do they clump together? Um, the pebbles don't quite, uh, rather the gas doesn't orbit the star as fast as the pebbles. They feel a bit of a headwind as they go around uh, the sun. So they have a tendency to clump together just like bikers, right, in the Tour de France have a tendency to form a peloton, right? It reduces the overall air friction, so to speak, that these clumps experience. Okay? So occasionally, once these clumps become massive enough, the solid material will, under the force of its own gravity, collapse and make an asteroid. Okay? So this is what we tend to call the streaming instability. Okay? You can see the streaming instability if you drive through the desert, by the way. If you look at how tumbleweeds cross the road, they typically will cross the road in families be a big tumbleweed and a bunch of little ones that trail. And that's because the big tumbleweed will create a wake, basically an aerodynamic wake, and the small tumbleweeds will hide behind it to reduce the, um, the air, amount of air resistance that they encounter. So through this process, you can make big asteroids. Okay, asteroids about the size of Ceres at most, usually 100 kilometers or so. So typically, you make rocks the size of LA. In time, then these rocks that are 100 kilometers across can continue acquiring pebbles that they uh, live around. It becomes really a game of the massive grow more massive because they have more gravity. They sort of collect remaining solid stuff in the disk and grow up to be, in the outer nebula, about 10 Earth masses. Once you reach this mass of about 10 Earth masses, then 
you become substantially, so gravitationally influential enough to start collecting gas. And that's what happens, and that's why we have the planet Jupiter. Okay? So the planet Jupiter, at its core, at its center, has a refractory ball of material, which is probably all made up of water, ice, and rock. It's about comprises about 10 Earth masses. One of the goals of the Juno mission, which is at Jupiter now, is to measure the mass of this core. Okay? So this is the, the kind of story of how the solar system came to be. If you look again here, you might ask yourself, why did this happen over here, but not on this side? Okay? And typically, in the solar system, this is attributed to sublimation of ice. Okay? Ice is everything. Um, what do I mean by that? And again, this is, by the way, planet formation circa 1995. Okay? I'm giving you the story as it was told you know, before Tupac faked his own death and <laughs> went to live on an island, okay? Uh, so the idea is that at about a distance twice as far away as the Earth is from the sun, um, ice can begin to reside in solid form, okay? So if you go far enough away, it's cold enough, ice, ice grains are... Uh, just that, ice grains. If you go closer than this distance, which happens to be right around where the asteroid belt is in our solar system, uh, if you go closer than this distance, ice evaporates, and you don't have as much stuff to make planets. Okay? If you believe that story, it reproduces the solar system nicely. Okay? You say, okay, over here there's a bunch of ice okay, such that um, at Jupiter's orbital radius, it coalesced into a 10 Earth mass core first. So Jupiter grew up. Um, at Saturn, it coalesced second. And Saturn grew up, but it grew up kind of late in the game, right as the gas was beginning to dissipate, about 3 million years after the formation of the Sun. And Uranus and Neptune, which are, by the way, 17 Earth masses each, would have become Jupiter and Saturn if the gas was still around, but the gas went away. Okay, so that's why we have ice giants, which are mostly made up of water ice. We've got gas giants here, and we've got sort of pathetic overgrown asteroids interior to 2AU, one of which we happen to inhabit. Okay, great. So, with this picture in mind, if you're going to go look for extrasolar planets, Okay. The one type of planets that you're going to go look for are the Jupiters. Why? For the following reason. The way that you would go about searching for exoplanets is you don't look for the planets directly. That's too hard. Okay. Traditionally, that's been too hard. Uh, you look for their signatures, the gravitational signatures that they impose upon their host stars. And this method has been known for a long time. It's called the radial velocity method. You look for the wobble of the star that is induced by the, gra by the gravitational pull of the planet, basically. And Jupiter, in our solar system, induces 12 meters a second of velocity upon the sun. If you can d resolve the fact that the sun will you know, sometimes move towards you or away from you if you're inhabiting another planet, uh, then you're pretty good. If you observe for about 10 years, you will see, you will resolve the orbit of Jupiter. Does this make sense? Sort of. Right? Um, so your telescope has to be this precise, and you have to observe not every night. You have to observe, I don't know, twice a year, because the orbital period of Jupiter is 10 years, right? So you kind of get the occasional data point, uh, and people did this in the 80s and in the 90s, sort of scraping by for telescope time, until 1995 came around and the first main sequence planet was detected right, by two Swiss astronomers, uh, Mayor and Quillos, and they indeed found a Jupiter. Right? They found exactly what they were looking for, except for totally not, okay? 
Um, if you just look at this plot, which shows, this plot shows you the real data. Okay? I usually work on theories. So I'm scared to look at real data, but this, this I can understand because I can see a clear sine curve. Okay? It's like things, you know, things go up and things go down. Okay? So this is fine. Uh, one of the, if you're paying attention, okay, uh, you might be like, well, this is, this is great. You know, this means that the star is coming towards you and away from you. Uh, but the air bars seem awfully small, right? The first planet that you discover should be on the edge of detectability, right? Your signal to noise should be, I don't know, not one, but like two, right? Instead, the air bars are pretty tiny. Okay, and if you look at the y-axis, this is in meters per second. It spans not 12, but 90. Uh, what's going on? Well, they found a Jupiter orbiting the host star with a period of four days. Not 10 years, but four days. So for scale, I brought with me, uh, I brought with me a dime. You know. Okay, so this is going to be my, my scale model. This is actually a pretty good scale model of the solar system. If you take a dime and take this to be the size of the sun and take a dust pebble, which I will pretend is in my pocket, um, and hold them out at about an arm's length, this is uh, roughly the distance between the sun and the earth. Right? Jupiter is five times that. Okay? This planet that they found, 51 Pegasi b, is 10 radii away. So it's five dimes away. It's orbiting like this. So it's super hot. Okay? So uh, thus, the exoplanet, the main sequence exoplanet revolution began, uh, and this class of planets called hot Jupiters was discovered. This is an artist's picture. Uh, in this picture, the hot Jupiter is blowing up. Uh, <laughs> they don't typically do that, but no. good enough. Um, so theorists were like, uh, what happened, right? Like we had a clear understanding that giant planets can only form where ice can sublimate, right? Beyond two astronomical units, way the hell out there. Why do we have a giant planet so close to the host star? And within months, maybe within a day, it was resolved because they, oh, we forgot to we forgot that planets can migrate through their protoplanetary disks, right? So just like a raft, which is sitting in an ocean and will sort of drift, drift around, a newly formed planet sitting in this gaseous disk can exchange its orbital energy with the gas and change its orbit. And in fact, we see some evidence of this in real time in Saturn's rings, little moonlets form inside the rings. They perturb the rings. They basically um, raise gravitational wakes in, the, um, in Saturn's rings and then gravitationally interact with them and move around. Okay, so people said, okay, theory is okay. Things still form beyond 5 AU, beyond you know, the ice line. It's just that they migrate inward. So, the last uh, couple decades uh, has been, in this subfield, have been dedicated to understanding exactly how do they migrate. Do they migrate smoothly, right, upon being born in this gas disk and then kind of slowly converging towards the central star? Or do they migrate violently? Do they wait until the gas goes away and then, you know, starting out on a Jupiter-like orbit, are perturbed onto a really, really elongated, really eccentric trajectory, such that they come really close to their host stars and then subsequently circularize due to tidal forces. Okay? And a lot of work's been done, uh, some of it here at Caltech. Does this make sense so far? Do you have any questions? Okay, so no question. Is, when I teach class, no question. Oh, I, I thought I was perfectly clear. Yeah. Yeah, due to tidal forces. 
Yeah, so if it was just pure gravity, right, it would get close to its host star, it would come back, and then next time it would come back around the same exact spot. Okay? If you include tidal forces, tidal forces burn up orbital energy. Okay? The reason the moon is receding, see it's confusing because the moon is receding, that's because the Earth is spinning faster than the moon. In this case, the situation is somewhat reversed. It's the planetary tides that, that dominate. And over time, uh, because the tides burn up orbital energy, the orbit just kind of circularizes. Yes? Um, how would the actually, OK. So okay. All right. So um, moving on, we can fast forward to two, 2012. And uh, you know, the problem is basically resolved. And the re reason you know it's resolved is because there's a Scientific American article. <laughs> um, so it says here, it's by Caleb, uh, Caleb A. Shart. Uh, it says, Lonely Planets, Hot Jupiters Are Isolated. Okay, that's the title. Um, it's really fascinating to read this article right, because over here it says that uh, the detection of hot Jupiters was a great surprise. To many, it was indeed a great surprise. But if you dig through the literature, there's always a Russian guy who <laughs> figured this out before everybody else did. Okay? So Otto Struve, okay, well, in 1952, wrote a paper uh, which was two pages long. And um, <clears throat> in this paper, he says, first of all, this. Okay? This is quite great. Right. There's no compelling evidence why hypothetical stellar planets should not, in some instances, be much closer to their parent stars. Okay? Uh, it is not unreasonable that a planet might exist at a distance of 1 50th of an astronomical unit, okay, which is indeed where how Jupiters are found, uh, and its period around the star would be about one day. And here's the crazy part. He says these things would be detectable with the most powerful spectrograph in 1952. The reason those error bars were really small is because right, astronomers, in some sense, were biased by the theory and waited around for 20 years to, actually 40 years, uh, for the telescope to be good enough to start detecting Jupiters, whereas hot Jupiters were available in the 50s. Right? Um, another interesting uh, part of this article comes here is there was no way that they could have formed in situ. Right? There's no way that these planets could have coalesced where they are, suggesting immediately that some mechanism must have moved them or migrated them. And this, is, this was a point um, which really got my attention. I learned this in grad school. I learned it in grad school that forming hot Jupiters where they are is too hot. Um, so that's kind of what I remember. And there are a lot of papers, if you just read the first sentences dedicated to hot Jupiters, that say it's well known that it's too hot to form hot Jupiters. And everybody, everybody knew that, including me. Um, without truly recognizing what it means to be too hot. Okay, so let's quickly, again, review what, what does it mean? What does formation do? Okay, so the first thing that happens, as I already mentioned, is the assembly of a 10 to 20 Earth mass core. And if you are assembling this core in place, then indeed, you might think that it's too hot because ice melts at 1,000 degrees. Okay? Um, but if you do manage to make such a core okay, by some process, it okay, doesn't matter how the core forms, that core will start accumulating gas, and once, the, uh, once it accumulates enough of it, it'll start accumulating it at a very rapid rate. That's how planets form. So the conventional calculation for Jupiter's formation at five astronomical units, where it is today, looks like this. This is a plot from a very uh, seminal paper by Polak et al., in 1996, here the core is taken to form uh, over a period of about 200,000 years. Right? It forms to about 12-ish Earth masses. 
And then the planet slowly acquires gas over a period of five million years, um, over the next five million years. And then once the amount of gas reaches, roughly speaking, the mass of the core, the process runs away. And in only 10,000 years, the planet grows up to become Jupiter. So a question that we looked into is, if you took the same exact calculation, right, and just turned up the heat, so to speak, assuming that the core somehow got there, what would happen at the hot, typical hot Jupiter radius? You had a question. You have a question? It can wait. OK. Did you have a question? Uh, can I have a question? Yeah. Uh, you can see, so you can't see the hot Jupiter itself, but you can see it occasionally eclipsing the host star, so blocking out the light. You had a question. Uh, actually, um, I'm asking you what's in situ. What's in situ? Oh, I'm so sorry. In situ, yeah, yeah. Uh, in situ is just what scientists say to make themselves sound smarter. Uh, <laughs> in situ means in place, right? So rather than forming some, somewhere else and then moving, it's just forming where, where it is now. OK, last quick question. Sorry? Do they form at specific temperatures? Um, the idea is that they have to form where it's cold enough for the constituents to be in solid form. OK, so it has to be cold. All right, so if we take this uh, story, right, at face value, then all of the hot Jupiters we observe have migrated from afar. But at this point in time, it's no longer 1995, and we have great results from the Kepler telescope. And the Kepler telescope has detected thousands of planets around other stars. And what Kepler has shown is that hot Jupiters are not the common outcome of planet formation. Instead, the common outcome of planet formation are planets sort of like Neptune, maybe a little smaller than Neptune, but they all reside at orbital periods of days to months. So the question we asked ourselves is this. What if hot Jupiters are not Jupiters that formed really far away and then migrated inwards? What if Hot Jupiters are just this population of so-called super-Earths or mini-Neptunes, where some of them just grow up to acquire the local gas. Right? So in other words, in this mass versus period diagram, could it be that instead of these guys migrating inwards to become that set of dots, it's instead this population of much lower mass planets that grows up? Turns out the answer is yes. Okay. If, it was, if it was no, I wouldn't tell you. All right. uh, you can take exactly that same code, that same calculation, and redo it at an ambient temperature of 1,500 degrees, and look what happens. You start out with your typical 15 Earth mass planet, which are found in huge abundance around sun-like stars. About half of sun-like stars have them. And if you just let it sit there for less than a million years, it can grow up to be a giant planet. So perhaps, just perhaps, this entire paradigm of moving stuff around through the nebula was yet another bias of planet formation theory circa 1995. I'm not saying that it never happens, OK? Uh, I'm just saying that there's nothing to preclude the formation of these giant planets where we observe them today. The null hypothesis, so to speak, doesn't fail. Um, it is 7 o'clock and 33 minutes, according to my Fitbit. And no scientific talk has ever ended on time. Okay. <laughs> Right, so I think at this point, um, I will stop, but not before showing you two more pictures. Okay, this is true. 
Okay, then that means that hot Jupiters should occasionally be flanked by lower mass planets. Right? They should be parts of systems that also host super Earth. We're beginning to detect, there are a few examples where this is becoming apparent. One is WASP 47, if you don't know it, not a big deal. Uh, the other one that I could sort of find uh, very quickly is Kepler 30. It's got a two Jupiter mass planet and it is encircled by some other um, lower mass planets. So I think, I think this is sort of the tip of the iceberg, if you will. I think as time goes on, we will find more and more evidence that hot Jupiters didn't really move, or maybe a majority of hot Jupiters didn't move around. They just formed where they are. Maybe it's simpler than we thought. Okay. I will stop talking at this point and take any questions. Thank you. Excellent question. Um, so some research that is done indeed here at Caltech by some stellar grad students uh, suggests that in binary stars, hot Jupiters are more likely to form. Okay? So if you have a companion star, it's, it's a better environment. We don't actually understand why, okay? but it's something we want to answer for sure. Uh, yes. Do we have any theories on why our solar system is different in its distribution of gas giants and these close in hot Jupiter? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad you asked. And, uh, you know, I don't know. How much time do, do we have? A couple hours? Yeah. So, yeah, so look, the answer is uh, yes. Um, it's problem I thought quite a bit about, and I believe, right, this is not, I'm giving you my, you know, story, not everybody else's story. I believe that the, <laughs> right, exactly, right. my viewpoint is that the thing that makes the solar system special is the combination of Jupiter and Saturn, okay? Uh, Giant planets that are distant generically are kind of galactically rare. Only 10% of sun-like stars have them. Moreover, most of them okay, have orbits that are highly eccentric. Right? It's rare to have a bunch of circles. Right? So I think that, that those two things alone already reduce the chances of the solar system. And I believe that Jupiter is the key to understanding why the inner solar system is so empty. Yeah, I think it is Jupiter's role in the primordial nebula um, that shaped the mass depleted nature of the inner solar system. Okay? I'll get to your question after this question, okay? You had your hand in. How does this fit into the Grand Tack hypothesis? Okay, so perfect follow up. So the Grand Tack hypothesis is a story about how Jupiter migrated through our solar system, right? And the Grand Tack hypothesis is actually something I like quite a bit, okay? Because it does invoke migration, but it doesn't invoke the giant planet losing all of its orbital energy. The migration story of you make a Jupiter and it becomes a hot Jupiter implies that that planet had to migrate by a factor of 100, okay? In the Grand Tack story, Jupiter had to migrate by a factor of 1.5. Okay, and like moves a little bit in, moves a little bit out. Okay, and I think that it is during this phase of moving in, okay, which explains, by the way, why Mars is a factor of 10 smaller than the Earth, is during this inward phase of migration that you can pick up, I mean, Jupiter can pick up uh, planetesimals into mean motion resonances and effectively grind them down because it excites their eccentricity distribution to the point where collisions become disrupt disruptive. And then once you grind down that population, it aerodynamically drifts into the sun. So you can deplete the inner solar system out of mass, which connects to your question, by 
having Jupiter move around a little bit in the nebula. You had your hand up. That's okay. Uh, which are the most habitable planets in the solar system? I only know of one. Right? I'm not moving anywhere. All right? In fact, I'm not, go, I'm not leaving LA. All right? like, that's how, um, it's a great question. Okay? It's, an, it's a great question to which, at present, I believe there is no answer. People talk about habitability all the time. Habitability of extrasolar planets, habitability of the Galilean moons, um, I can't answer that question because so far I have a data point of one. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a question I allow myself to think about. I mean, I'm pretty sure that there's like eight, so you can get Mars if you change it up a bit. Mars, yeah. I'm, I'm all up for changing up Mars, you know. <laughs> really, really, I mean, yeah. Change it up or demote it from the planet list. <laughs> Yeah. Solid cores that are about that size. Yeah, they have solid cores that are that, that size, okay. but most of their mass is hydrogen and helium. Okay. And in fact, it's beneficial. If you want to accrete hydrogen and helium, it's beneficial to be really close to the star. Why? Because uh, even though locally there's not that much, as the disk evolves, all of it will sink or accrete onto the host star. And by all of it, I mean 80%. Okay. Uh, so you get to interact with mo the most amount of disk if you're in the innermost ridge. There's another question somewhere right there. Yes. Ah, that's a great question. So, um, do hot Jupiters evaporate? If you just, if they had no magnetic field, hot Jupiters are so massive that they themselves would only lose about 1% of the mass over the age of the universe. Okay? Because they have strong enough gravitational fields that even though the sun is blasting them, they, they only lose a small fraction of their mass. There has been one case, uh, the planet is called WASP-12, where if you observe it in ultraviolet versus optical, you see it transit at a different time, okay? which be, it's not that the planet is in two places at once. There's no quantum mechanics here. Uh, it's just that the planetary magnetic field is allowing, um, allowing it to create a bow shock, okay? which, which sort of leads the planet. Okay? So you can measure kind of where the strength of the magnetic field that way. They, so that's one case where I know it has been. There's at least some observational evidence for planetary magnetic fields in the hot Jupiter regime. Uh, your question? Would solar winds affect the initial contribution to the gas or solar winds cause power? Yeah, so it's a great, uh, do sol would solar winds uh, affect the initial phases not during the formation phase. Why? Because everything is embedded in this thick uh, gaseous disk. So where planets form, it's super dark. In fact, this is one of my, um, yeah, it's not really a pet peeve. I don't really care. But uh, if you look up pictures of protosolar nebula uh, on Google, it always shows kind of this very tenuous gaseous disk. And you can see all the uh, planetesimals, all the asteroids actually looks nothing like that. It's a dark room where you can't see anything. And occasionally, okay, it's just like floating around in every thousand orbits, a big, you know, chunk of rock size of LA comes and hits you. Okay. Um, Last question. Yeah. So I have two questions. Uh -huh. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So there is a quantity known as the Roche lobe, uh, which determines how close you can be. Uh, a period of less than 0.8-ish days is for sunlight star, for typical sunlight stars, is the critical number. That's when the stuff that the atmosphere basically starts to go into the orbit around the sun. Um, every sun-like star okay, will, over its, towards the end of its lifetime, eat up hot Jupiters. Okay? But the good news is hot Jupiters are not alone. Earth is also doomed, okay? because <laughs> the sun will expand and eat us also. So we're in good company. Um, I think we're out of time. Okay? I can hang out for uh, a little bit more time if you want to come and talk to me after. I'll still be around. All right, thank you. Good idea. All right. Thanks for sticking around, everybody, for the panel Q and A. Um, so again, you're free to come and go over the next, well, only uh, 70 minutes or so until nine o'clock. Out to the telescopes and come back in here. But uh, our panel today consists of Antonia Oklopcic who is a graduate student here in the, in the uh, Caltech Astronomy uh, Department. Uh, and she's an expert on galaxies and exoplanets. Uh, Trevor David, who's also a graduate student, uh, they're both finishing this year, right? Uh, in uh, Finishing their PhDs this year in the Caltech Astronomy uh, Department. Rob Zellum is a post, oh, uh, and Trevor does exoplanets and stars. Uh, Rob Zellum is a postdoc at JPL, who does planets and telescopes, and I'm Cameron uh, Hummels. I'm a postdoc here, and I do lots of things, the universe simulations and the space program. But feel free to a ask us questions about things unrelated to the things here, and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, so do you guys have any questions about any kind of astronomy or physics or what have you? Yeah, yeah, we may just make answers up, so. Yes. My grandpa went to Caltech and was an astrophysicist um, in 1937. And in 1944, he wrote to Einstein, and we don't know what he wrote to him, but Einstein writes, Dear Sir, in 1944, Dear Sir, you will scarcely be able to imagine how hard the physicists have toiled to solve the problem you write about in your letter of J July 16th. In any case, there exists no electric charge on the surface of the Earth great enough to create the field by its rotation. It is my opinion that the physical laws so far established offer no basis for the explanation of the Earth magnetic field. Do you guys know what he was talking about? Elson Benedict. But, yeah, it's unclear what exactly. There exists no electric charge on the surface of the Earth great enough to create the field by its rotation. Yeah, so... Right. So... The, well, do you, I'm not a planetary guy. I'm the one non-planetary. Do you guys want to talk about the Earth's magnetic field? So I, I don't. I don't know if I will answer your question specifically. And I didn't. I didn't know. So I, I think the the accepted idea. Yeah, I think the accepted idea is that, that there is molten iron in the core of the Earth and it's rotating yeah. and that generates a magnetic field because anytime you move charge, you create a magnetic field. But I'm sure there's plenty of details that I don't know and are, are still not known, probably. Just about charge on the surface and we all know that the there is an outer core, liquid core, it creates uh, by rotating, creates... 
that's the that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and and the magnetic field is actually really important to us here on life because you know there's the sun, like Constantine was mentioning, it has this huge solar field, the solar wind that's always pushing out these charged particles, and those are not actually very good. You don't. This is why um, astronauts are always worried about having plenty of insulation on their spacecraft, for example. Solar storms are pretty dangerous. Uh, they could kill you. Not good. So um, the, sun, the Earth's magnetic field actually shields us from the harmful particles of, of the sun. So we think that's why we think that magnetic fields are very important for forming life on extrasolar planets, is that we think that you must have a magnetic field because early uh, little microbial life if there's not a magnetic field on it, then the solar particles, remember, it has like a huge solar storm, will kill that, and then you really don't have anything cool growing up anymore. <laughs> Does the magnetic field ever perform? Uh, not too, too much. Um, probably what can happen sometimes is that the way the magnetic field is, you've probably seen photos or just drawings of it. It sort of like makes two big loops that go from each pole to the pole. And what happens is when the solar particles come in, they spiral in on those poles and they actually cause the aurora. Uh, some spacecraft, when they cross over certain parts of the Earth's magnetic field, they have to just shut off. The Hubble Space Telescope, for example, orbits very close comparatively to the surface of the Earth and it actually has to shut off because it hits too much solar particles. So it can be dangerous in that sense. Yeah, good questions. No more questions. Thank you, guys. See you tomorrow. <laughs> to have life, correct? Or to have a magnetic field in general? <laughs> Sorry. One more time. Yeah, so we think that a magnetic field potentially could be required uh, to form life. Another idea is that the atmosphere could be so big and dense that it could actually help shield the life forming on, on a planet. But I think the real answer is that we actually don't know. We don't know what kind of exotic life might be out there that, and what it may require. So I think our best guess is that for, the life, for our life, we need a magnetic field to protect us, but we don't know what else might be out there. In, so the question is, why do the lower orbits, you mean smaller orbits in the solar system? Oh. Uh, it's just that the stuff is so small that it doesn't really look that big. Um, so you're like, you're just asking like, why don't you go in the nice sky and see tons of satellites? Yeah. You actually can. So if you were to wander out to the football field and just randomly look up, 20 bucks says, don't hold me on this because I don't want to lose $20, but you'll probably see a satellite crossing in the sky. Um, there's tons of stuff in low Earth orbit. They actually have labs here uh, in the US and also I think in Russia, all around the world that are very concerned with, with mapping not only satellites, but tons of space debris to make sure that you don't have collisions because have you guys seen gravity? And that's where our space yeah. Yeah, the space station's in low Earth orbit, and as you remember, Sandra Bullock doesn't like you know, stuff hitting the International Space Station. That's bad times. Yep. So that actually could potentially happen in the sense that you could have, and the space station does get impacts all the time of little micrometeorites, tiny little uh, sizes of sand of grain, basically, grain of sand. So potentially, yeah, because they're moving at thousands of miles per hour really quickly. So the question is, um, Constantine mentioned that um, in his theory and some others of how you might form a hot Jupiter is that you would get other smaller planets flanking 
on an interior and an exterior orbit to the hot Jupiter, and why is that? I believe the answer is resonances. So he was talking about um, how, you know, when you have something large, like a Jupiter mass planet, it can shepherd all these other smaller bodies. Uh, and what ends up happening is that they start forming their own planets themselves. Those, those bodies might grind down, like you said. Um, and so I believe that is the answer, is that there's some kind of resonance um, going on. So the, essentially, the large, massive planet is facilitating additional planet formation. So, okay, so exoplanets are just uh, planets around any star other than our own sun. So we know about, about 3,500 planets around stars other than our sun. Um, just recently, this past week, there was a discovery of seven planets around a single star. Um, I believe that's the highest number of planets found around a single other star, uh, and they happen to all also be the same size as Earth. I guess there are different strategies on how you can choose your stars. So, for example, the Kepler satellite, uh, it just looked, looked uh, at a fixed uh, portion of the sky and just looked at all the stars that were in that part of the, part of the sky. Uh, some uh, other methods looked at either the nearest stars uh, or the brightest stars. So there are different ways and uh, how you want to select your stars. But in principle, yes, you want to choose your star and then look at the star. So these seven, uh, if you mean by this announcement last week, they didn't actually look at the movement, they looked at transits. So they saw a little bit, so star, uh, the light from the star, gets, the star gets less bright when a planet crosses in front of it. So it's basically like an eclipse, like a little eclipse. Uh, so this is how this, these planets were found using this method. So there's, there's um, three, like, three very popular methods of finding planets. The first was... Uh, that method that Constantine talked about called radial velocity or Doppler method. Um, so it, it, the principle is exactly the same as Doppler radar, uh, you know, that the police might use to try and catch you speeding. But so the, so the idea is that you're seeing the motion of the star wobbling about. Uh, the other, as Antonio said, is this transit method. So you look at a star for a very long time, and then you see very regular dips every time a planet crosses in front. The problem is you, this only works for stars with planets that are along your line of sight. So if the planets are orbiting you know, in a totally different geometry, you won't see it. And then the other is actually imaging. Um, and so this is uh, essentially when you take the light from a star and you block it out as best you can, and you try to image faint points of light nearby. Uh, but historically, these tend to not overlap in terms of the types of planets that they're sensitive to. And this is going to sound like a dumb question, and it probably is a dumb question, but anyway, if you're on uh, the space station, you happen to die, can that body be jettisoned out to an orbit and slingshot around into other orbits? Is this <laughs> okay, sorry. Sure. Are you are talking about a human body or yeah. just a body? Yeah. Is this what you would like to happen? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, we should repeat the question. And, yeah. <laughs> so, if you're on the space station and you're with someone else and they die for whatever unmentionable reason, 
I'm never traveling with you on the space station, by the way. And they die. Can you jettison them out to an orbit? And what's, I think it's also part of another follow-up question to this is what's the official party line for doing it with dead bodies? I think the official party line is you put it on the resupply Soyuz and you launch it back to Earth and they get a proper burial in the ground. And launch it back. But no, no, they actually, so the, the, the space stations are serviced every so often by like Falcon 9 rockets by SpaceX and also the Soyuz and they'll come up and they'll dock the ISS. They'll bring on uh, 500 pounds of of supplies and food and whatnot, and they also take 500 pounds of trash back. And sometimes they might take 500 pounds plus another 200 if someone were to die, and then they would marry, bury them back in you know, Russia or the U.S. or wherever they're from. But could you take a space body and sort of push it out yeah. so you could, just yeah, jettison just jettison it out so it burns into the, the, the sun? Sure, you could, yeah. Well, you have to push it right into the sun, and then it would eventually just sort of fizzle away, burn away. But he doesn't want you. He doesn't want to get rid of the evidence. Oh. So it's my understanding that that he doesn't want to be responsible for for someone's death and then get rid of the evidence. He wants, were he to die in space, to live forever, going beyond our solar system. Right. So, yeah, well, I don't know if they're going to want to track you, but, but they, no, yeah, <laughs> maybe they do. They don't want you to run into their other spaceships and yeah. such. So, so yes, it, it, it is possible uh, for an object, whether it's a body or whether it's uh, a cup of coffee or something like that, to be ejected from the ISS or something like that and you can make careful calculations about what its trajectory will be, what its orbit will be. By default, uh, it would probably remain, unless they push it really, really hard, it'll be in a similar orbit to that of the International Space Station orbiting around the Earth. It'd be dangerous for the space station um, and your dead body. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, with with enough thrust on it, you could thrust it into the uh, farther out from from the uh, the Earth's orbit around uh, around the sun or something. It would uh, that'd be a pretty cool way to go. Yeah, so, okay, so, right, the question is, um, for the stars that we know host planets, um, do they all tend to have the same metal content? So, um, in the stars, right. So there are, um, there are two things that are really important that govern the evolution of a star throughout its life, and that's its mass and how much metals it, it has. Um, so the answer to your question is that we do find that more metal rich stars tend to, to host giant planets like Jupiter more frequently so there is a correlation with metal content and um, hosting bigger planets uh, that being said I think for terrestrial planets the same has, has not been found that it essentially is insensitive to the metal content uh, and also, we do know of some pretty extreme planetary systems that exist uh, around even metal poor stars. So, um, yeah, uh, Antonia actually today was talking about a system that has a really low metallicity, and the planet must be very, very old, uh, must have formed right after the Big Bang, essentially. Um, So this one particular planet that uh, Trevor mentioned uh, is the oldest known uh, planet. It's believed to have formed uh, just one billion year after the just after the Big Bang, so it's almost 13 billion years old. Uh, it's in a globular cluster, which it's the only planet that we know of in a globular cluster, and it or orbits around a pulsar. Which, so it's a very special uh, planet, uh, and it's the only one of that kind that we know of uh, for now, at least. Yeah. 
Oh, it's very far. Uh, but it, it, it is one of the closest globular cluster to us, but it's still, uh, in terms of planets, it's one of, I think, uh, more distant ones. Yes, it's it was detected uh, with pulsar timing. I should say that the globular cluster is a collection of very old stars, um, essentially arranged in kind of like a spherical distribution that orbit uh, out of the plane of the galaxy that kind of like orbit around uh, the top of the galaxy. You can think of it that way. Um, and then a, this, this planet happens to be orbiting a pulsar that's a, essentially a dead star. Uh, so my favorite is the transit method because that's the method I get paid to do. So that's obviously my favorite. So uh, as we were saying before, there's a bunch of different methods. One is actually taking a direct image. You null out the star. You just basically block it with your hand. It's a little bit more advanced than that. <laughs> and then you can actually see the light uh, emitted from the planet. The other one is the transit method where if you're really lucky, a planet will pass in front of its star and block out the star's light. It's very much like a the lunar eclipse that's going to happen here in the next few months. Uh, so when the planet blocks out the star's light, the larger the dip in the brightness of the star tells you how big the planet is. Big dip in the brightness of the star, large planet, small dip, small planet. The other one is the radial velocity method where the planets will tug the star back and forth and you actually see the star basically come towards you and farther away the, through the Doppler shift. So the radial velocity and the transit method are more tuned towards planets that are large and close to their host star. Be simply because if it's a planet that's large and close to its host star, it's going to wobble the star really quickly back and forth over a period of a few days. So I can watch a planet that orbits its star once every three and a half days. I just need a few nights of data to get the entire phase curve of the radial velocity to figure out the planet's mass. Same thing for transiting. Larger the planet, the more light it blocks up from the host star. And I can go, uh, part of my job is really tough. I have to go and use telescopes in Hawaii. So I actually have to fly out to the big island. I have to go up to the top of Mauna Kea. I have to watch a pretty sunset on Mauna Kea. And then I have to stay up all night observing this planet. And my planet, HD 209458b, uh, orbits the star every three and a half days. So I can watch it on a Tuesday. The next time it will pass in front of the star is three and a half days later. But it's during the daytime, so that's no good to me. So I have to go snorkeling and scuba diving and go to the brewery in between. And then a week later, I can go back up and look at another pretty sunset in Mauna Kea, use the cool telescope again, and then I, you know. So it's a really tough life for an observer, guys. Yeah, don't recommend this for any of you. Yes, the IRTF is remotely observable, but the scuba diving, come on. You've got to go scuba diving. You have to look for Dory and Nemo. So, so with the transit method, you can actually see and actually look at how the atmosphere of, of the, the planet actually absorbs the star's light. And by analyzing how the light pattern of how the atmosphere of the planet absorbs the star's light tells you about the atmospheric makeup and the structure of its atmosphere. So that's when we're saying we're finding water, we're finding methane, we're finding carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide in these planets is all through the transit method, some of it's the direct imaging method. We can actually get atmospheric information about these planets' atmospheres, which is pretty cool. So like James Webb Space Telescope, the next big Hubble replacement, that'll be using the transit method, also be using the direct imaging method. That's more suited for planets that are farther away from their host star. Because if a planet's very close to its star, the star is really bright compared to the planet. It's like looking for a firefly next to a lighthouse and you're a mile away. So you want to block out that star's light. And it's easier to find something that's really far out, like where Cameron's head is, if the, you block out the star's light here, than something like right here. Because the planet just gets lost in the, the brightness of the, the light of the star. That's a great question. Thank you. Sorry, I talk so much, guys. <laughs> yes, it was the pulsar timing. That's right. It's, um, I guess, similar to the Doppler uh, method. It's instead of um, these neutron stars, 
uh, have uh, jets uh, of particles and radi uh, strong radiation coming from their magnetic poles. And as the uh, pulsar rotates, this jet uh, irradiates different parts of the sky. So every now and then if it passes, if it sweeps across uh, our line of sight, we see a pulse uh, from the neutron star. And we can measure these pulses very, very precisely. But if uh, the pulsar has a companion, it will wobble around a little bit. So it will become slightly more distant and slightly, it will come a little closer to us. And this will be detected as changes in the pulsation period. And by measuring these very, very precisely, we can say uh, something about the uh, nature of the companion, about how massive it is, how many companions are there, and things like that. So yes. They're usually in radio, yes. Yeah, I think timing is much more precise. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer, but to the, the question is, can you, so the pulsar planets are found by measuring the differences in the timings, as Antonio just explained, uh, but your question is, could you use the Doppler method so to use any kind of Doppler method uh, in astronomy, you need multiple wavelengths. And so I actually don't know enough about radio observing to know if it would be possible to do this. But you'd have to be measuring multiple wavelengths at once with your radio telescope in order to get the baseline to see the shift, basically. Uh, whereas if you, were, you could just, in principle, measure the pulsar timing at a single wavelength in the radio and measure the timing difference. The timing is a much easier uh, detection to make than trying to figure out because they're, uh, as, as they were suggesting, the, in order to get the redshift, the Doppler redshift that's, that's coming from the object, you need a baseline and a single frequency. And this is, is emitting over many different frequencies. So it's kind of a broad detection. So it would be difficult to see how it shifted, whereas the timing is a very clear cut. Uh, thing to detect. Oh, you saw the Orion Nebula? Okay, so the question is, why do nebulas glow? Um, there are a bunch of different kinds of nebula. Uh, some are called reflection nebula, so it's not that they're glowing, it's that they're just reflecting light. In the same way, if you walk into a dark room, and you shine a flashlight around, the things that you illuminate with your flashlight aren't glowing, per se. They're just reflecting the light from your flashlight back to you. So that's a reflection nebula. Uh, but the Orion Nebula is not a reflection nebula. It's, a, it's an emission nebula, so it is truly glowing. And in that uh, environment, you have a lot of gas and a lot of dust that's strewn about. And then you have a couple of, well, uh, more than a couple, many different stars that are forming in that, in that environment. And the most massive and the most luminous of those stars are actually putting out so much energy that they're not just illuminating the gas around them, but they're actually heating it up. And they're heating it up so much that it's starting to illuminate. It's starting to glow and radiate itself. So that's usually, when you talk about an emission nebula, it's usually that you're, you have some bright, hot source within that, like a star or a bunch of stars that are putting out so much energy that they're heating up the gas around them that's causing that gas to then uh, emit radiation as well. So is that like a neon light? That's a very good analogy. Horsehead Nebula is also uh, an emission nebula that's also found in Orion. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, from from my opinion, definitely. Um, ah, that's that's a that's a different take on it. So, so the the right. Uh, so the question for people who couldn't necessarily hear is: Is there more uh, collaboration, international collaboration now than there was in the past, say during the Cold War? Uh, and kind of the follow up is: It is it because it's more or less national, nationalistically driven to do scientific endeavors. Are they still funded in the same way? Um, so that's a really big question, and I'm sure we all have different opinions. But uh, I think collaboration in general is up because of things like the internet that enable you to collaborate very effectively with people across the world, whereas 50 or 100 years ago, collaboration was like, I'm going to write a letter to uh, someone in London, and it's going to take six months for me to get a response from that person, so I'm just going to be doing a lot of stuff in isolation. There's also been a drive towards, across the sciences, doing a lot more large-scale collaborative efforts. So 100 years ago, uh, people were using Mount Wilson telescope on the, in the San Gabriels here uh, and doing stuff on their own. Uh, or in small teams, whereas now in order to have a state-of-the-art telescope, you need multiple countries to come together to provide funding sources to, to have enough money and resources to build these state-of-the-art telescopes, like uh, the ones that are being built in Hawaii or the ones that are being built in Chile that are billions of dollars that you couldn't just have one person or even one institution like Caltech that's that has enough funding to do this. So that ne necessitates having a lot of collaboration between people and teams and countries. But in terms of nationalistic uh, goals, yeah, certainly during the Cold War, a lot of the scientific uh, discoveries that were being made were driven by nationalistic priorities. I, the space, I don't think we would have gone to the moon were it not for the space race and for the nationalistic goals that that both the Soviet Union and the U.S. set because, well, after the space race ended and basically the Cold War went away, nobody's been to the moon in the last 40 years, which is ridiculous to me that we have the technology, we demonstrated it in the 60s and the 70s, but nobody's gone back because there isn't the drive for that. So perhaps with kind of the new Cold War that's starting to occur now, it'll drive us to go back and reinvest in, in some of these things. I mean, the silver lining to uh, what may be more problems. But uh, I don't know. Uh, do, do you guys have additional comments? I, I kind of rambled there. Yeah, I would say, in general, the, the trend is towards probably more collaboration. Um, uh, I can speak for myself. Like, I have international collaborators. Probably all of us have worked on some level with um, international collaborators. Uh, as Cameron said, like, large-scale projects and, and like the things that really push science um, like LIGO, uh, CERN, things like this almost always involve some kind of large international collaboration on a more microscopic level like or not microscopic but just smaller level like NASA's missions for example uh, NASA's next big upcoming exoplanet mission all of the data will be made public um, as soon as it's available so anybody anywhere in the world, whether you're a professional or an amateur, uh, no matter what your institution is, can download it and discover a planet the day that the data become available. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say in general, it's more towards open science sharing data. Also, because astronomy, maybe since the 90s or so, uh, has there's been a lot more surveys. And so it's going from a, kind of a data-poor science to a, an extremely data-rich science. And we simply don't have enough people to analyze all of the data that's available. Um, so, yeah. What's the name of that next exoplanet mission you just referred to? 
it's uh, it's called TESS. It's so it's a small scale. There's another. There's a James Webb Telescope is supposed to um, is is the successor to Hubble, although it's in the infrared. Um, and the the exoplanet mission I mentioned is called the Transiting Earth Survey Satellite TESS. Um, and and even now, actually, uh, Constantine mentioned NASA's Kepler mission. Um, and in Kepler's second stage, it's been observing. Uh, different patches of the sky, and that data also is public, publicly available. So if anybody wanted to discover the next big planet, um, you could download the next set of data, and that, that system I mentioned before, this TRAPPIST-1 system that maybe people have heard about with seven Earth-sized planets, uh, it's being observed right now by K2, or it, it was just finished by this uh, K2 mission, and the data will become available in a few days, so you could in principle, figure out how to download it and then find the next planet around that system. So the question is, uh, with the new administration, uh, what is the funding situation like at JPL? Um, if you're an Earth scientist, some of them are very scared, to be completely blunt, because there is potentially large cuts for Earth science. So I know there's many people at JPL who are very worried about the lack of funding that might be happening very soon. Luckily, I do exoplanets, and while I'm studying global warming and climate, don't tell this to anyone else at Capitol Hill, while I'm studying global warming processes around planets, around other stars, you know, it's looking for life and aliens. So I'll, people like me will be okay, but I know there's a lot of people that are doing Earth science that are, so, that are very worried. That being said, there's other uh, people in the new administration that really want to push a lot more um, uh, solar system studies, like a, a mission to Europa, for example. Europa is a, uh, a moon, it's an icy moon that actually is, uh, it's due to tidal forces as it orbits around. It actually might have a liquid water ocean underneath its surface, and there actually might be life on this moon. So we're going to be sending potentially a probe out there to look for life in the oceans of Europa. So that's a big push for that. Uh, we're thinking that Mars funding, for example, Curiosity, Spirit and Opportunities, Mars rovers, for example, Mars 2020, which will be the next big Mars rover, that uh, will likely be all okay too. So um, I think the general mood on lab is that things are mostly good. If you're an Earth scientist, I know a few people have been kind of scared about potential funding cuts, to be brutally honest. Well, the, when people have been asking about that on lab, and we've had actually visits from congressmen even to talk about this, is that, you know, uh, the official party line is that weather is important for anyone. Whether you're actually studying weather to look for global warming impacts or anything like that, you know, people at the end of the day will care about if it's going to be raining or sunny this weekend, because we have to know if we have to go surfing or stay inside in L.A., right? So, you know... There's, there's, I'm sure people will be fine, and uh, or hopefully people will be fine, and they'll find, you know, do new ways. But there will be, there's been studies or uh, statements by like the governor of California who said that he'll even help fund his own satellites, and California have his own global warming satellites and weather satellites to study this. So, and I'm sure other countries like China, Russia, they all care, especially China right now, looking at you know mitigating smog, for example, and looking at weather patterns there, that other countries will definitely probably step up and also launch more satellites too. So hopefully the U.S. will continue to pioneer and you know, be a strong force for studying Earth climate and Earth weather patterns, but if not, I'm sure other countries will definitely step up and, and take over too. Sorry to put a pall on the entire audience there.
So I, I do both. I do ground-based telescopes, like going to Hawaii and using telescopes here in California and Arizona. Um, most of the data in exoplanet discovery in terms of characterizing their atmosphere is dominated by space-based observatories like Hubble and Spitzer. Those are the big two. Uh, planet finding missions, the main uh, dominating ones are the Kepler spacecraft, which has been staring primarily at that one patch of sky. It found hundreds of exoplanets, if not thousands of exoplanets. And now it's continuing to slew around the entire sky looking for more and more planets. There are tons of ground-based surveys, though, looking for exoplanets, and they discovered hundreds. WASP is one. Uh, HAT is another. Uh, there's tons. Oh, just little tiny telescopes probably the same size that you guys are looking out literally behind us. They just take t eight to ten of those, put them in a ram remote site on a mountain, and they just look for transit events. Honestly, it's literally the size. There's an eight-inch refractors back there. Perfect. Eight and ten-inch, literally the same type of telescopes back there are being used all around the world to discover exoplanets. And they're finding probably one every so, every often, like probably once a day at this point. I had an app on my phone that actually told me whenever an exoplanet was discovered, because I'm a giant nerd, surprise, I work at JPL, and it would go off at the very beginning when I downloaded the app, it would go off like once a month, then new telescopes come online, it would be like once a week, and the Kepler mission launched and it was like 50 times a day and it broke my phone, so we're discovering exoplanets all the time. They're, they're everywhere, so that implication is maybe life is somewhere, because I want to ride in the Millennium Falcon, come on, that'd be sweet. Um, all sorts. So the telescopes directly behind us? Uh, uh, so the, the telescopes are Dobsonian style telescopes, which are uh, reflectors. They have a, a parabolic mirror at the bottom that, that uh, okay, now I can use the chalk. Uh, so they're a Dobsonian style or a Newtonian style telescope. You've got your tube pointed towards your object. The light comes in. There's a parabolic mirror down here. So light comes in and it focuses to another little mirror that's right here that's a planar mirror. And it just redirects the light out the side. And then you have your eyepiece here. So the light comes down, it focuses onto this point it comes out and then you've got a little lens here which brings it to focus on your eye. And uh, so you can observe whatever is going on. Uh, the, generally when you talk about the, the power of a telescope, a lot of people mistakenly think that the power is how much you can zoom in and magnify things, but that's not so important for when we're looking at astronomical objects. Yes, you want the ability to see small or large things, but uh, what's oftentimes more important is the collecting area because effectively what you're doing is you're taking all the light that's going through this entire aperture. Uh, in this case, we have a 6-inch, an 8-inch, and a 10-inch diameter aperture. So that's this distance is about 10 inches. And you're, you're collecting all that light and you're bringing it to focus on your pupil and the diameter of your pupil when it's dark adapted is about eight millimeters. So you're collecting all this light and dumping it onto your pupil so that you can see fainter and fainter and fainter objects because you're collecting, instead of just the light that would normally enter this eight millimeter pupil, you're collecting all this light over a much larger area and dumping it into your pupil. So the telescopes, for instance, uh, on Mauna Kea that might be observing things, the Keck telescopes, which are partially run by Caltech, this aperture, instead of being 10 inches, is 10 meters. So it's like the size from here to the back wall, almost, in terms of the diameter of the mirror that, that uh, is collecting all of this light. And there are telescopes that are actively, actively being constructed, like the Giant Magellan Telescope and the 30-meter, te the, the TMT, the 30-meter telescope, which are 30 meters in size. So. But again, as we said earlier, these large, large-scale instruments cost more and more and more money, and so they have to be international consortia that build these things because they're just too expensive. Um, but yeah, this is a, 
I gave you a very long answer. Maybe you just wanted to know, it's an Orion telescope, and I gave you all kinds of additional information. It's an Orion telescope. The telescopes that we have, just for reference, the smallest one, the six inch diameter one, is about 250 bucks. So it's not that much money. Uh, the eight inch is like 400, and the 10 inch is maybe like six or 700. Uh, and then the eyepieces associated with them can be anywhere from 30 bucks to, we have one eyepiece that's like 400 bucks. So it's more than one of the telescopes. So steal that. So steal that one. That's more portable. You can put that in your back pocket and run. But uh, does that roughly answer your question? Okay. Uh, the gentleman in the back that we haven't yet heard from. Yeah, so the question is, um, what other techniques might there be to detect planets? Um, and specifically, could you use gravitational waves, which have just recently been detected? Um, the answer to the gravitational wave question is no, uh, unfortunately, right now. Uh, and the reason that is is because, so gravitational waves are funny. They're, you know, our instruments are insensitive to the distance at which the gravitational waves are uh, coming from because there's no, um, there's no, dif the, the signal doesn't diffuse through space, doesn't get weaker. But uh, you need really energetic events, which is why when we detected the first gravitational wave signal, it was two really massive black holes colliding. So that's a lot of energy um, colliding, essentially. Uh, so event like that, you know, we're working for decades to, to find. By comparison, the energy of a planet orbiting a, a star uh, is, is very small. But also, is the answer here that there's no, there's no like, decay of the, yeah, there's no decay of, of the planet spiraling in, generally. Th that might happen in, in some cases, actually. You know, planets could spiral into their stars. Uh, and so that, you would need that. But second of all, the signal would be far too weak to detect with anything we have now. There are some other fringe methods for detecting planets uh, that don't get discussed as much. One is, th is this pulsar timing uh, technique uh, that we d talked about earlier. Essentially, if you have this dead star that's acting like a flashlight, like a beacon um, that's spinning and, and you know, sending these pulses your way, uh, you can see differences in the timing of when those pulses arrive at Earth based on uh, the, that dead star getting further away from you and closer. So it's essentially similar to the Doppler technique, uh, but it's distinct. Um, and then there's other similar kind of idea where you see pulsations in a star. You see pulsations in a star, and then you see that those pulsations happen with a regular frequency, but it gets modulated. And it's modulated by the frequency of the planet's orbit around it. And microlensing. Microlensing happens when uh, you, you look towards a crowded patch of the sky where there's a lot of stars. And every so often, you will see a star pass in front of another star. If the star passing in front of that other star has a planet as well, what you see is you see this brightening, which is the light from the background star getting lensed or magnified by that foreground star. A and on top of that brightening, uh, just a little bit before or after that, that brightening event, you'll see a tiny little spike on top of that signal. And that's actually the planet lensing the light from the background star. And so this technique is, uh, you know, it works in a statistical sense, meaning if you look at enough stars, you'll see these events all the time. But you can never observe the same event twice. You can never be sure that you're observing the same system again. So it's kind of just a one-off technique. Months. I think it could be maybe 
weeks as well, yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess it would depend on, uh, on the, the speed of the, of the star that's lensing, doing the lensing, uh, relative to your uh, line of sight, so how long it's overlapping. So if it's moving slowly, it could last a long time. If it's moving quickly, uh, it would be short. I believe, oh, so the question was, uh, do we know the status of the 30-meter telescope that's being built partially by Caltech, partially by a number of other consortia on the summit of Mauna Kea in the Big Island of Hawaii? Um, it was shut down because of protests about concerns by the, the native Hawaiians being concerned with not going through the proper channels for constructing this and somehow desecrating sacred sites on the mountain and uh, other things wrapped up in the sovereignty of, of Hawaii too. Um, and to my knowledge, right now it's, they're seeking additional permits. So the, the original cycle had gone through to get permits and it seemed like they didn't jump through all the hoops. Uh, uh, Caltech and the other uh, consortia that are responsible for, for constructing the, the 30 meter telescope. And so I believe it was set back and they needed to go through another period of attempting to get the permits and having a waiting period where people could voice their concerns over the, over the telescope. But I think there were also plans made for a secondary site, uh, which is Canary Islands. Uh, so just off the African coast owned by Spain, um, where there are a number of telescopes that are mostly run by Spain and the European Union there. It's not as good a site as Hawaii, I would argue. Uh, maybe people would disagree with me. It's not as good a site. There are very good telescopes there, but, um, but there are no concerns over uh, native inhabitants having problems with the construction there. I don't believe there are a lot of native Canarian Because the elevation is not as high, and so the, the reason why Hawaii has always been a good site for astronomy is that at the top of Mauna Kea, you're above this cloud inversion layer. So you're above the clouds, and you see through much less water vapor and much less atmosphere in general. Um, and in the Canary Islands, the elevation is not that high. And uh, I think another issue is that they get dust storms, actually, off of... Um, from The dust is, is from, from the Serengeti, I think, that just blows over at some, some point during the year. Sure. Um, the, I would say the second best site in the world other than Hawaii would be, or you know, maybe equally good is in Chile. Uh, but there's already a, a giant telescope going down there. Uh, and so ideally for the astronomical community, you don't want two giant telescopes in the same hemisphere. You want one in the north, one in the south, because if, if they're both in the south, you can never look at things too far north. So there are already many telescopes that are built um, on the summit of Mauna Kea, uh, one of which uh, Rob actively observes with. I think there are something like 25 telescopes that are built on a series of different mountaintops that are all maybe within a mile and a half of each other. So you can actually go up to the site. Uh, there are tours that allow you to go up around sunset to watch the sunset because it's really pretty. And then they shuttle you off back down the mountain very quickly so your headlights don't disrupt the astronomical observations that, that are going to be taking place. So the next time you're in Hawaii and you have the opportunity, it's pretty cool to check out. But there are a number of telescopes that are built up there, but there was one kind of peak off to the side that was being held over as this site for the construction of the, the TMT, the 30-meter telescope, and that was the one that was raising concerns. A lot of the native Hawaiians have been upset with the construction um, of any of the telescopes because there was concerns that it was um, impinging on sacred land to the, to the Hawaiians, and 
and just concern that uh, a lot of different concerns. I'm not. It's 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 a big deal. So um, whereas the canaries don't necessarily suffer from as much of this kind of these issues, or in in northern Chile, there are not as many issues. There there aren't as many native inhabitants in the high Atacama Desert in the Andes uh, to with concerns about this. You had a question. I'm, yeah. First of all, I would say I do not know whether you get a chance to sit in a panel like this. It's a privilege and an honor to oh. get so much top-notch oh, yeah. uh, explanation from the current and future world leaders in these, these fields. Can you tell that also? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the question was, uh, after a lot of very kind things that you said about our panel, uh, uh, how did each of us get go from being in middle school to being where we are today? And we'll keep it short because this could very easily get long. Uh, I yeah, I just really enjoyed sciences in general. I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to be in astronomy and physics. I enjoyed chemistry and a variety and math and a variety of sciences. Uh, went to public school all the way through, uh, went to college, pursued computer science actually as an undergraduate, and later kind of transitioned towards doing computational modeling of astrophysical systems. But uh, yeah, I mean, my only advice is just keep studying science and, and mathematics and, and enjoy those subjects and, and see where it takes you. Just keep looking out for opportunities that you can get involved, whether it's in clubs in your school or extracurricular activities or talking to your science teachers and math teachers about ways in which you can do more on the stuff that's interesting to you. Always follow what's interesting to you, even that if that takes you in a different direction. Oh, man, I really wish I did space camp. I never did space camp. But in high school, I did tons of science Olympiad. I was, did robotics and astronomy. Um, the astronomy club vice president, I think. I don't know. But I wasn't always the best at school. I always worked really, really hard. I actually failed my physics midterm in high school. <laughs> yeah, I did not study enough for that guy. But, you know... I loved it, so I just kept on working really hard. So even if you might not be the absolute smartest in your class, don't let that get to you. Um, not all of us are really smart, and if you just really work really, really hard, you can make anything happen. So just keep on persevering is, I guess, my best advice to give to you, and definitely join lots of clubs and stuff like that in middle school and high school. Yeah, hi. Um, so, what, sorry, what's your daughter's name? Julia. Julia. Hi. Uh, my story is maybe, I wasn't like super, super into science always. I think I was always kind of fascinated by nature and, and stuff. Uh, but I guess what got me interested in astronomy is something kind of maybe a little corny, but my parents like woke me up in the middle of the night and made me watch like the Leonid meteor shower or something like that. So things like that, looking through the telescope, if that's cool to you, then that's a good sign, you know? Uh, so. Actually, seeing things like that are, are really, I think, also probably all astronomers, you know, even though we spend very little of our time actually looking up the night sky, uh, I think probably a lot of us actually do enjoy going to a dark site and just looking at the stars and not even, at least for me, not even thinking really that critically about it. Um, but I'd say, you know, especially today, uh, you know, encourage, like, computing and, and like learning more about computing because that will be helpful for any career but also any field of science uh, and so that's really important um, yeah. Okay. yeah so yeah like uh, they said I was interested in science uh, from very early age I think I decided to become an astrophysicist in my seventh grade I think so <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, rem I actually remember the evening. I, I it was it was kind of late. I went to my dad and I was like, Dad, what do physicists do? And then he was like, oh, I don't really know. I guess they do experiments. They work at like universities. I'm like, yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I was like science, math, uh, 
programming. I think I started learning programming in high school, so that's, I think, very important. And yeah, as long as you enjoy what you're doing, I think that's the most important thing, and just work hard. I'll also say, so astronomy is a really small community, so if you're interested in astronomy specifically, uh, you know, when you become maybe like high school or something, I know I have a collaborator that was working with two high school students uh, over last summer, uh, and her students found a new planet. Uh, so as I said, like there's all these opportunities, and basically if you just connect with people, and if you live in Pasadena, there's so many people here that work in astronomy, uh, there's really, it's, I think it's probably a pretty easy field to crack into that way. Uh, so the question is, does anyone know of any objects, astronomical objects, that have a net charge? In general, macroscopic objects, like even the size of humans, or buildings, or trees, uh, let alone planets or nebulae, tend to have net neutral charge because, well, there's a lot of stuff there, and if you have something that has a net charge, like it's net positive or net negative, it's going to probably over time, first, the chances of that have it happening on its own are very, very low unless there's some weird phenomena driving it. But it will tend to run into something else that will balance it out in some capacity. And in fact, attract things that will balance it out in, in, uh, in its charge. So to my knowledge, no. I don't think there are any macroscopic things that we have that are that way, that, that have net charge. We talk about charge black holes, but I think that's just a theoretical thing, or there's any chance of observing them, or anything like that. Yeah, that's I think in principle, that's just a theoretical thing. Yeah, charge, char yeah, sorry. Uh, the question was whether charged black holes can exist. So yeah, in principle, there are three quantities that can describe a black hole. It's mass, it's spin, and it's charge. But real astrophysical black holes, we, we think, only possess mass and spin. We don't know of any charged black holes. That yeah, I'm not sure how you would detect the charge actually measure the charge of a black hole, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Let's put it this way, we don't, we don't measure charge generally in astronomy. Physicists might, but as far as I know, <laughs> uh, we tend to not talk about charge uh, in, in the context of observations. And it seems to me, uh, if you have a bunch of charge and it's accelerating at any level, then you'll get radiation as well. So, which would, which would dissipate the energy from the system. So, I, and we'd probably be able to pick up on that radiation, that light. So, I, I don't think there's any evidence. Although, it, there, there, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I don't know of any evidence for like astronomical objects that possess net charge. Uh, the gentleman in the front. So uh, this is the question is, uh, according to your reading, uh, during the Big Bang, there should have been as much matter as antimatter that was created, and so and if so, so why don't we why don't we necessarily see that? Because our universe appears to be full of matter, right? We're all full of matter, and there's if there were antimatter, matter and antimatter annihilate each other and release a bunch of energy. This is related to a question that we've had numerous times from another audience member um, about... Okay. But you keep coming back, so. Uh, so, 
obviously we have more matter than antimatter in the universe. I don't believe, and I may be mistaken even though I put the universe as one of my specialties, uh, there's a lot of things in the universe that was a bold statement. Uh, I don't believe there's, are there requirements by the, by cosmology, like lambda CDM that necessarily you, you have matter and antimatter conserved? I didn't think there was. I think, I, I think so, yeah, I think so. But I'm sorry, I can't give a full answer. But I don't think, yeah, I don't think there's a requirement by the theory to have both. And it's a good thing, because there's not. And if there were both, then there wouldn't be any matter at all, or antimatter, because they'd just all annihilate. Or you'd have one part of the universe where all the matter lived, and another part where all the antimatter lived. It'd be a very dangerous place. Um, one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Gentleman in the back. Ooh, great question. Excellent question. This was asked at well posed about 400 years ago, 300 years ago. It's called Olber's Paradox. So the question for everybody who didn't hear, it is Olber's, right? Okay. Uh, the question for everybody who didn't hear was, why do we have a dark sky? Why, when we look up at night, when the sun's not in the sky, is it dark? Because there's a ton of galaxies out there, and there's a ton of stars. So theoretically, in any direction that you look when you go up in the sky, I'm kind of adding on to your question. A any direction, any point that you pick in the sky, you're eventually going to run into a star or a galaxy that's a long ways away from us. That was the, at least the original uh, way it was posed by this guy, Olbers. I don't know. I think it was like three or four hundred years ago. They'd, yeah, he's dead. But, uh, and it was this paradox, like, why, why is the sky dark? And do you guys want to talk about this, or should I talk about this? I'm, I'm, I'm rolling. Yeah, I know about the universe. So, um, essentially, it's a case for why the universe is not infinite, either in extent or in time. Because if we live in a steady state universe that has always been around, and it, it's infinitely large, then it's exactly correct that light would have enough time to have traveled from all those distant stars that go on, remember, to infinity, if we're buying this infinite universe thing, which is not necessarily true, um, and that light would have had enough time to reach our eyes from all these directions. So either the universe is not infinite in its extent, or it's not infinite, infinitely old. It hasn't been around forever. Because if that, if that were the case, then all this light would have, would have arrived at us. Um, and we currently, we can't speak to its extent. We can't speak to whether or not the universe is infinitely large, because as you pointed out, uh, there's an edge. There's an observable edge, because l the universe is only, according to uh, the current theories in terms of Big Bang cosmology, the universe has only been around for about 14 billion years. And so what that means is the light has only been possible to travel for 14 billion light years in distance before reaching us. So stuff that was, that's farther away from us than 14 billion light years, we just don't know what's going on. And therefore, if there are stars out there, their light hasn't yet arrived at us. So, but we don't know if it if it goes on beyond that we we just don't have information about that because light can only lights as fast as anything can travel to us and information and so we we don't know what's beyond our observable edge but does that roughly answer your question does either that um, time or time? or both but we generally think that uh the universe has a finite beginning 
uh, during the Big Bang, which is about 14 billion years ago. And so because of that, that is enough to say why there's not light coming from all these directions. Because if, they're, they're, if the universe does extend beyond our kind of light sphere that we know about, here's, here's us, the Earth, and here's the sphere around us with a radius of basically 14 billion light years. So 14 billion years ago at the beginning of the universe, after the Big Bang, uh, light would be traveling for those subsequent 14 billion years to us. But if there are stars out here, we just don't know about them because the light was traveling, but it hasn't yet gotten to us. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, dust could get in the way, but if it's been infinitely long, then that dust would have heated up to the radiation, to the temperature of the radiation.